Super. All right. So while um, people are still joining, but it looks like we are getting uh, have quite a good sized audience already. I'll just welcome everybody to our Friday uh, CIFAR and AIDS education program conference. A um, couple of notes on upcoming things. So hopefully people enjoyed the, the session we had a couple of weeks ago on motivational interviewing. I got some um, expressions of interest in doing some sort of a training with that. Please do send me an, a note. You can either just uh, chat me directly in the message or um, in during the meeting or send me an email at some point if you're interested in that. Um, and, and we'll work on arranging one. Um, and then also upcoming, we will have uh, updates after CROI. And then also we have later in the spring to look forward to um, a talk from Bob Silicano. So a couple of those things on the horizon, but uh, let's turn our attention to our special guest star for today. So I was thinking a lot about what to say about um, Tom Quinn as an introduction, because there is just so much that one could possibly say, but I decided I would focus on the fact that I think he is one of those people who is like a living example of career success in from the definitional standpoint of just taking great joy in his work and meaning. And I think that that to me is the kind of thing that that helps to keep you motivated and engaged and finding the joy and interest in the work all the time is just something I have always looked for in mentors and people that I, you know, would say something like, oh, I want to be like him. So from, I will focus on that in my introduction. And I think he'll hopefully give us a little bit of his, his career background too, as part of this uh, talk. And i um, just really excited to have you here today, Tom. Great. Eileen, thank you so much. And uh, I really appreciate the invitation uh, to go over a topic that's very close to me and uh, reflects a lot of the work I've been doing for the last 45 years. So uh, it is a time of reflection and, and so forth. So I will give an overview of, of what the situation is in the world within, I'll end with uh, the US uh, situation in terms of HIV AIDS. Uh, I don't really have any disclosures to to declare. Uh, and here's the outline of my talk. Um, I'm going to give a little brief history about the evolution of the pandemic. I like to do that to just ground everyone as to where this epidemic, how it started out and where it, it moved to its current situation. And then I'll, I'll provide uh, what uh, are the latest statistics on the global situation of HIV. And I'll do that both uh, globally, uh, lumping every uh, area of the world together, and then also break it out regionally. Uh, and uh, so you can see what's going on in Africa, Asia, and so forth. And then I'll, I'll uh, second sort of final part, we'll be discussing the global efforts in the control of, of HIV, where we are and what the challenges uh, are uh, for the future. In terms of background, if anyone's interested in diving into this or like some of the statistics or the perspectives I might be giving, um, these are the main references uh, that I pull a lot of my data from. It, it's really the one in your upper left, the path that ends AIDS. This came out in July of 2023, so it's only six months old. And UNAIDS does a great job of providing all the statistics for the different regions. Um, it's quite detailed, uh, has lots of information. Highly recommend that uh, as a source uh, for a lot of what I'll be showing you. Uh, also, last year, um, I was involved in two publications. Um, uh, one is PEPFAR at 20, and I'll give you an update on that. Uh, and also a paper that we put in the Lancet HIV that sort of came out of a, a class lecture I, I gave. And I did that with Jean Letega. Um, and that is called the Global HIV Control. Is the glass half empty, half full? And, and honestly, I still feel that way. And uh, we'll see how people feel after I give this presentation. Uh, and I had an opportunity and invited talk or invited paper on 40 years of AIDS, a retrospective from the way forward. So those are my 
uh, sort of references for this talk. But let's go back in time. Let's go back to 1981, June and July. Uh, we're all confronted with the MMWR coming out with these uh, cases of pneumocystis cranii pneumonia that occurred in gay men in LA and in New York. Uh, but also, uh, uh, they identified this uh, unusual sarcoma, uh, Kaposi sarcoma. And it really opened up our, our eyes as to emerging diseases and that these can come on so suddenly. And obviously, on the heels of COVID, uh, this sounds very reminiscent. And it took us a year to start working out some of the epidemiology of this disease. Uh, and it was done by looking at end stage AIDS, basically. Uh, opportunistic infections in this sarcoma occurring in Haitians that were living in the US, very unusual since up to that point it had all been in gay men. But it also started to show up in individuals um, uh, with hemophiliac, uh, who had re uh, others that had received blood transfusions started to occur in children. Uh, and even in female sex partners of uh, bisexual men that had AIDS. So this is the evolution of the epidemiology. It's going slowly and people are dying because there is absolutely no treatment because we didn't even know what was causing this disease. Well, I got interested in that first report about cases occurring in Haitians that were living in the U.S., and I figured if that's what's happening, what's going on in Haiti itself? Is this disease prevalent in uh, in this country? And so uh, Dick Krause sitting with me, and yes, that's me with dark hair, not gray as it is or white as it is now. Uh, we flew down there in 1982 uh, at the invitation of the Ministry of Health. And we started an investigation. We went into a nearby hospital. This is just one of the wards. There were so many people that were afflicted uh, by AIDS uh, that they didn't know how contagious this was, whether it was airborne or, or what. And they just started putting them all into these individual rooms, as you can see. Not very private, lying on cots, uh, really uh, unbelievable situation all of these individuals with a fatal disease that we know of, of AIDS before, again, there was any treatment. What was noticeable, though, was that it was occurring equally in men and women in Haiti. Uh, and this intrigued us because that was very different than what was happening in the U.S., where 95% of the cases were in young men. Um, and so we did some investigation. We found a lot of these Haitians with the disease had been in Africa uh, uh, 20 years earlier. And so uh, with a group of us, uh, there I am on the right in that photograph, uh, but with CDC and colleagues from the Institute of Tropical Medicine, we flew from Haiti in the U.S. and Europe uh, into Kinshasa, Zaire. We picked Kinshasa because that's where the Haitians had been working and had come back to Haiti. And we figured, all right, maybe a decade had transpired, but we didn't know how long the incubation of this disease was even at that point. So we went in there and we set up a very rudimentary laboratory. You have to remember, if you don't know what's causing it, how do you diagnose it? Well, in AIDS, it was the decline of CD4 cells. So we got monoclonal antibodies to CD4 receptors and an epifluorescent microscope that I brought uh, from, uh, the, uh, from Hopkins and NIH. Um, and we started doing uh, CD4 counts in these individuals. We went on rounds to the hospital at Mami Amo Hospital. And just like in Haiti, they, th these wards were just filled with people with overwhelming uh, uh, pulmonary infections, didn't have really good diagnostics then, but a diarrhea wasting syndrome, which got sort of coined as Slim's disease uh, in the adults, and most of them dying within a very brief period of time. 
Uh, the physician of uh, who was head of the Department of Medicine actually uh, had been keeping a diary of these unusual, what, slim disease cases and cryptococcal meningitis and other types of, of pneumonias that were fatal in these and did not respond to any antibiotics. Turns out uh, he'd been keeping that diary and had been seeing these cases since 1970. So although the U.S. identified uh, and started, uh, you know, we always date it to 1981 with that MMWR, really it had been going on for over a decade and by the time we had gotten to Kinshasa. And uh, Billa Capita, who was the department chair, was just a phenomenal uh, investigator uh, and was a, really a, a pleasure to work with uh, as we uncovered all these cases. We went into the pediatric wards, and, and this is just a quick shot of them, um, and, and we found that they were dying uh, quite similarly. They were given diagnosis of malaria, um, but did not respond to anti-malarias, and they never saw the malaria parasites. But they were obviously also dying of the same disease. So uh, it was uh, equal in both men and women. Uh, and so Peter Piot and a uh, number of us in the investigation did write this first paper on AIDS occurring in heterosexuals uh, in Zaire. And, and we said that this situation in C Central Africa represented a new epidemiologic setting for a worldwide disease significant trans, uh, transmission in a large heterosexual population. We took those samples that we collected from the individuals and we sent them to uh, the Pasteur Institute where Luc Montagnier and colleagues were working uh, uh, on um, identifying LAV, uh, lymphadenopathy associated virus, which obviously we now know is HIV. Uh, uh, Bob Gallo um, also uh, confirmed uh, these uh, same uh, recovery of the viruses. This uh, actually, we were able to recover the very first HIV strain from Africa from this original study, uh, sequenced it, showed it was different than what was going on in the, in the U.S., uh, but was one of the similar clades uh, related to HIV. In retrospect, it was pretty clear. Interestingly, um, we were approached by one of Montagnier's uh, collaborators, Brun Vizinet, and said, could you give us some uh, serum samples uh, because we want to try and develop a diagnostic assay. So we shared them actually with the Gallo lab and with the Montagnier lab and actually were able to develop an EIA for this uh, to look at antibodies to this virus that was just being identified. And lo and behold, we then were able to utilize serologic assays to identify people who were infected even before they developed AIDS. And that opened up completely our ability to investigate the epidemiology of this disease. But while that works going on internationally, you can see what was going on domestically, uh, an absolute disaster of an epidemic. Um, uh, within just one decade, uh, it had become the leading cause of death among young men, 25 to 44, in the United States. And that's shown on the graphic uh, on your left and on the right, uh, because everyone was dying from this disease, because we really had no effective therapy, um, all these quilts, uh, it was called the AIDS quilt uh, program, it actually covered the entire uh, park, uh, national uh, park uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, an unbelievable sight to see and to drive home uh, the lethality of this disease. Well, let's fast forward, uh, that's history. Fast forward to where we are today. And I'm picking up from 1990 on this graphic and taking it out to 2021. And you can see that by uh, the 
intervening time period, more than 80 million people have been infected with HIV. Living with HIV are now 39 million people, meaning that uh, over 40 million fatalities uh, over a 40 year span, uh, really. And th the number of cases um, uh, have risen over the last decade of 24%. And that's because many of them are living longer, uh, but still carrying the virus, obviously. Uh, since they've not been cured of it. So another way of looking at the map of HIV worldwide is, is shown by a prevalence map. And that's what is shown here, giving you an idea of the areas that are most afflicted by this disease. So as I mentioned, there's 39 million people living with HIV. In 2022, the last time this uh, the numbers have been reported, and they're still counting from 2023, but in 2022, one year, 1.3 million people became newly infected. Uh, and e despite therapy, uh, which we're so accustomed to, there were still 630,000 deaths. So it's no longer the number one leading cause of fatalities as it was back in those uh, 80s and early 90s. But nevertheless, it's still uh, an extremely high number to deal with. And when you look at the map and by a prevalence, and that's shown in the legend over in your far left, you can see Sub-Saharan Africa still uh, suffers the greatest burden uh, of this disease. So if you take those numbers uh, and look at it on a daily perspective, that's 3,600 new infections occurring every single day. 50% of those are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Actually, there used to be 66% of those cases were in Sub-Saharan Africa. But as you'll see in this talk, that number is declining uh, at a really good rate. Uh, trying to control it where it, it had its greatest impact. Still, 10% uh, are still occurring in children under 15 years of age. Some of that perinatally transmitted, some of it uh, acquired even in young adolescents. And 90% then are among adults, 46% um, now among women, 30% among young people. 15 to 24, and then 18% uh, also among young women. The other number to drive home was with those fatalities of the adults due to AIDS in those early years and before treatment got uh, disseminated all around the world, uh, children would lose one or both of their parents. And so they were called AIDS orphans. And this gives you a graphic uh, which to me is very uh, dramatic, uh, rising up to a peak of 18 million children orphaned as a result of the loss of one of their parents or both. Uh, it is now coming down, and that's the good news. Uh, that's where that glass uh, half full is uh, sometimes sitting there. Uh, and you can see it's coming down uh, uh, globally, but it still persists in, in a number of African countries. Uh, and it is something that uh, we should be well aware of. Now, who acquires HIV is always uh, the, the most common question on a global perspective. And it turns out key populations still are making up 65% of those new infections I was talking about. Uh, and and uh, that's no surprise to people on this call because we still see it very common in gay men uh, and other men uh, who have sex with men, bisexual men, and injecting drug users. In other areas of the world, there, this, uh, this circle would be distributed differently. You see more sex workers or more clients of sex workers or Although this particular pie, it's 35% um, general population, it's actually higher in areas of Africa uh, where we see a lot of heterosexual transmission. So what are 
what are the current strategies for controlling this disease uh, and for getting treatment uh, out to the masses that really need it? And are they working? So I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on, on this particular question. And the strategy for addressing HIV control is very simple. Uh, it's get everyone tested for HIV and on a regular basis. Uh, and if they're positive, move them into the care continuum. Everyone on this call usually is involved on that particular aspect. If they're negative, then they need to be moved into the prevention continuum. And I'm gonna talk about that after we talk about the care continuum. So what is the care continuum? Well, it's getting people who are positive onto treatment immediately. It took us a long time, probably 30 years, to recognize uh, that we needed to get people treated immediately. We used to wait till their CD4s were below 500 or below 350 or below 200. That's all changed. If they're positive, they need to be on therapy. Um, and what kind of therapy? Well, in the first decade uh, and decade and a half after the virus was identified, um, the scientists around the world actually worked out its life cycle. And as they worked on the life cycle, they found places where you could interrupt its replication uh, or uh, its movement to other, to other viruses. We haven't fully cured anyone uh, in an effective way. Uh, yes, there's been bone marrow transplants with CCR5, Delta-32 deficient uh, uh, um, transplants. But by and large, you can count them on your two hands at this point. Uh, and uh, when you think about 80 million people, that uh, that's you know, pencil dust. Um, so you can see these are the different areas where you can attack the virus. Here is a list of FDA approved drugs. This is a couple years old, two years old. Uh, and so there may be a few new ones, but uh, right now, it gives you an idea that the pharmaceutical industry jumped on this uh, and, and all of these drugs uh, were developed, went through clinical trials and have been approved for use. The beauty of that, and again, the glass is getting fuller as we're discussing this, uh, is that uh, there's at least 13, maybe more, but 13 single tablet, tablet once a day ARV regimens approved in the US that can be given uh, to HIV infected people. Um, so that makes treatment really easy. Now there is resistance and they have to be monitored and, and adjusted as that occurs, but this is revolutionary. And it gets even more revolutionary when you think that uh, you can even get an injection once every two months if you can't be adherent to an oral regimen. Uh, and uh, Charlie uh, Flexner has talked about uh, the future of where this is going, and, and I won't repeat some of the ones that are, are being investigated and, and studied. The great news with once a day treatment or once every two month injection is that we've changed this from a fatal disease, which it was for 15 years, all the way out to now a completely uh, normal lifespan for an HIV infected individual. Yes, they may have some immunologic abnormalities, um, chronic inflammatory processes, but by and large, uh, we've extended their lifespan from one year to 53 years once put on therapy. Now, back to a little bit about uh, working internationally um, was I would work at Hopkins and we'd treat uh, people in the wards and, and in the clinic uh, and they would get better and they'd go home and leave those normal lives. But then I would go to Uganda uh, and this is what I would see. People just lined up. This is the AIDS ward, uh, outpatient clinic, sorry. Um, just with people waiting uh, for these revolutionary antiretroviral drugs that weren't available. They were in the 
high income countries, but not anywhere in the low income countries. So what, what does that spell out? It spells out in equity. Uh, and it really was the birth of global health uh, from my perspective. In year 2000, the cry out, the demand for these relatively expensive drugs to get into poor countries uh, was, um, was heard. Uh, it actually went to the, to the uh, UN Security Council, unanimously approved, uh, was a plan to attack this disease internationally. Um, you can see the United Nations uh, actually had the AIDS ribbon uh, displayed uh, in its windows. This was a remarkable time uh, in which we really identified the inequities in health uh, that occurred around the world, but it focused in on AIDS. And that revolution continued with President Bush, uh, who came up uh, in his uh, you know, State of the Union address with a revolutionary idea of, of let's take U.S. taxpayer money and let's attack this disease where it is so prevalent, and that was primarily in Africa. Uh, and so the goals were pretty straightforward. He said they Congress approved this. They set aside $15 billion. It was just a five-year plan. Started in 2003, and here are the goals. Uh, very straightforward. Uh, people thought they were a bit lofty, um, but attainable. Um, so what's happened? Well, that five-year plan uh, has marched on for 20 years. Uh, and I, I do want to take a minute to show you some of this. Uh, PEPFAR has saved more than 25 million lives globally. It supported antiretroviral treatment for 20 million people, so just PEPFAR alone. The U.S. funding for PEPFARS now totaled, went from that $5 billion to over $110 billion. $1.9 billion in 2004 to right now, pending before Congress, is a, a plan for $6.8 billion uh, for 2024. It's pending reauthorization. Congress is, um, I, I don't want to say, but if you want to write your congressperson, please do it. This is absolute. It's always been bipartisan. It's always been reapproved. Um, but I think uh, that needs some pushing at this point. Um, so uh, write your nearest congressperson. It's the largest commitment by any nation financially to address one single disease. It's actually amazing. So it had PETFAR has supported testing for over 64 million people in just 2022. I mean, that's just phenomenal. Uh, it's prevented five and a half million babies from being born with AIDS, PMTCT, uh, provided care for more than seven million orphans and vulnerable children, supported training uh, for over 340,000 new healthcare workers. And again, uh, the U.S., and it is the taxpayer's money, we are the single uh, largest donor to the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. $28.2 billion has been provided. So what, what are the metrics as uh, when you take PEPFAR and Global Fund, what do you achieve? Well, that's this graphic. So it's from year 2000 to 2020. We're up to essentially round up 30 million people on antiretroviral therapy globally. The line is the mortality rate. Uh, and as you can see from, from HIV infection, and it peaked around 2004, 2005, and since then has been declining and it has declined by over 51% in just the last decade. So therapy is indeed life uh, sparing uh, and has a dramatic uh, impact. Uh, within uh, that time span, a little bit about 25 years, 
we've averted 21 million fatalities that would have occurred from AIDS. Uh, and I can tell you for those who work on tuberculosis, uh, the most effective decline in, in TB related uh, HIV, uh, in TB related deaths have occurred among duly infected people, HIV and TB, because treatment of HIV uh, eventually affords uh, a good response to anti-tuberculosis drugs. Now, how are we doing with prevention of mother to child transmission? That's shown on this graphic, again, last decade. Um, this is the percent uh, of women who are on antiretroviral therapy before they deliver and during breastfeeding. So globally, we're up to 82%. Uh, which is um, good. Uh, it, it's really uh, compared to 2010, it was only 48%. But why isn't it 100%? I, I always say. So we'll get to that. When you bring therapy to these poor countries where over, I, and I love this graphic, uh, it's looking at life expectancy in six African countries. You can see back in 1950 with other vaccines and other types of, uh, um, of uh, uh, health uh, uh, interventions, you actually get an increase of 20 years to life expectancy until 1990 when a, and even before that, when the AIDS uh, scourge started mar marching across uh, the continent of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And all those life gains were essentially lost, uh, almost 20 years, if you look at some of these graphics. Then you bring in therapy uh, in the mid-2000s, and, uh, and that all starts to come back, as you would expect. Uh, I, when I saw this graphic, I said, well, what's going on here? Well, I think everyone listening can guess what's going on here. What year are we looking at? 2021. We have the COVID pandemic now hitting some of these and interruption in therapy in a lot of these countries. So it's a combined effect of COVID uh, and uh, lagging in ARV therapy. So again, trying to look at the global picture, we still got a gap of 9 million people that we need to get on to therapy. And until we do uh, that, we're going to continue to see uh, problems with this pandemic. Now, uh, in terms of that control, the big question that comes up, if we're getting people on to therapy, and we're preventing AIDS-related mortalities, is that having an effect in decreasing transmission uh, by making viral loads go down uh, through therapy? And the, I, the, again, a step back in history, uh, because I, I always find this fascinating, where we had the first inkling that viral load uh, had an impact on transmission uh, was actually in mother-to-child transmission. The higher the viral load in a pregnant woman, the greater the rate of transmission to their infant. It, nowadays, that's sort of a no-brainer, but back then, and this is 1999, we didn't really know that until we had these really good assays for detecting viral load. Um, and you can see as viral load comes down, once it gets below 1,000, then usually the mother uh, does not transmit to the infant or at very, very low probability rates. So having done that study uh, in, with some colleagues, uh, uh, we turned our attention uh, as sort of my theme of looking at heterosexual transmission. And I was working in Uganda in Rakai and we had access to 415 uh, uh, heterosexual couples in which one person was positive and one was negative. And we were trying to intervene with behavioral interventions and so forth. And we looked at their viral load and rates of transmission. And if you just combine the men and the women, you can see that uh, in that particular study, 
Once it got to undetectable at that time, less than 400, we didn't see any transmissions. Uh, and that was true male to female or female to male transmission. Hidden in this study, which we finally pulled out, was if the man was circumcised, it really didn't matter what the female's viral load was. The circumcised man did not acquire HIV. And since we did a circumcision trial to see if that was true, um, we actually found a, close to a, a 60 to 70 percent efficacy rate from circumcision, which is now um, one of the interventions to slow uh, HIV transmission acquisition uh, in Africa among heterosexual uh, men. But back to the viral load. So uh, Mike Cohen actually wrote an editorial about that paper and thought, well, wait a minute, let's really go out and do a randomized trial since my study was observational. Uh, and uh, they devised the 052 trial um, published uh, a decade after that initial one in August of 2011 with a follow-up in 2016. And the bottom line is uh, that there were no linked infection among discordant couples, and they had thousands of them that they studied when HIV was stably suppressed by antiretroviral drugs in the HIV-positive partner. You would think that would be the end and we would move to uh, making that policy. Well, turns out there's a lot of skeptics out there in the world. And so more studies were done. There was the partner study, the opposites attract study, the partner two study. And just summarizing those, it showed absolutely no linked, that's after sequencing of the virus, no linked HIV transmissions in these studies with over 150,000 acts of condomless sex when the partner with HIV was stably suppressed by antiretroviral therapy. Well, what did that translate to? It became uh, uh, the mantra, if you will, U equals U, undetectable equals untransmissible. What's amazing is that that was not really adopted by WHO, by uh, other major agencies until 2019, uh, 2020. Uh, but now that is the, the mantra and it, it, and it ha does hold true. And this paper came out in August, just six months ago. Uh, and this is the cover of Lancet. Zero risk of sexual transmission of HIV with viral loads of less than a thousand copies. These data provide powerful opportunity to destigmatize HIV and promote adherence to ARV therapy. Well, you would think, oh, that that's great, but then the debate rose. Well, why are we saying a thousand copies? Uh, we say undetectable is less than fifty or less than twenty-five. Um, whereas others are saying less than a thousand. It turns out that people who are having those blips between 200 and a thousand, we can't really call undetectable. They have a high probability of eventually spiking and becoming viremic. So we really need to advocate for truly undetectable. Uh, but nevertheless, WHO said we need some metric by which we can motivate uh, populations to get to at least below a thousand copies, in which case probability of transmission is in fact low. So they set up in 2018 uh, these uh, uh, guides uh, that we should be attain the 90-90-90. 90% of people should know they're infected, 90% of those people should be on therapy, and 90% of those people should be uh, less than 1,000 copies, what they were considering virally suppressed. That would result in less than 500 new infections by 2020, zero discrimination. Sadly, by 2020, we had 2 million new infections that year. So that didn't work. Uh, so they set new targets. 
and maybe a little bit more realistic. And they said, maybe by 2030, we should be at 95, 95, 95. And that should result in 200 new infections in adults globally. So how are we doing? Uh, what are the, the results? Uh, and, and this is, again, people living with AIDS. You got 39 million people living with AIDS. If 95% of them should know their infection, where are we? Well, we're at 86% globally do know that they're infected with HIV. Then you take this number and what percent of those should know should be on antiretroviral therapy. The aim is that 90% of this number should be on therapy. And uh, where are we? We're at 76%. Remember the gap? That's the gap we were talking about. It should be higher than that. And then uh, the number uh, that are virally suppressed in that 95-95 thing, it's... Uh, uh, the, the goal is 86% of the, uh, of the entire HIV population should be virally suppressed. We're at 71% globally. So good news, uh, it is improving, uh, but we've got a ways to go. And it varies by region. So down on the x-axis, you can see the different regions. So the numbers I just showed you are the global numbers. But if you go to the African region, you can see they're slightly different, actually a little bit better there. Eastern uh, and Southern Africa, Western Central Africa, here's the region of the Americas, Southeast Asia, it's not doing too good. European region could be even better. Uh, forget the Middle East, uh, it's a disaster in more ways than one. Uh, and they're only at 24% viral suppression. Uh, so the AIDS epidemic is going to continue uh, for a long time in that region. And then the Western Pacific. We're going to go into a lot more of these regional ones uh, in the next few slides. How are we doing with PMCT? For the global, I had pointed out we're at 82%. How does it vary by region? Um, you can see the variability. Um, uh, it's only 59% in Southeast Asia, 67% in all of the Americas, 19%. Uh, uh, and again, stigma is what's driving a lot of this, uh, as well as the wars and uh, other civil unrest issues. How are we doing in terms of just treating uh, children who are HIV infected? And for the pediatricians that might be listening, this is actually quite sad um, because they're not keeping up uh, for a variety of reasons. They're not being tested. They're not getting access to, to care. Only 41% of HIV infected children under 15 years of age uh, are, are getting um, virally suppressed. That's really the number. It's these last numbers that I, I focus in on. Now, PEPFAR, uh, and this just came, came out, um, you know, likes to look at uh, what their metric is. Uh, are they achieving uh, their goals? And actually, if you look at Tanzania and South Africa, two countries, the, in the red bar is what it, the viral suppression rate was in 2017. What is it in 2022 is in the blue bar. And so you can see for both countries, it's it's actually going up. PEPFAR is working, uh, but how do they get it up uh, to achieve that 95% uh, range? And we'll come back to that. But if we're doing all this treatment and we're working to get people virally suppressed, how effective is it in preventing that transmission? Uh, and so that's uh, the next set of graphics I wanna show you. So here are the number of new HIV infections occurring annually, uh, shown on the x-axis, um, by the number of new infections on the y-axis. Uh, and you can see a 38% reduction over the last 20 years. So great success. Where's our target for 2025? It's down here in this little um, uh, cyan bullet. If you will, it's got a, a ways to go. So 
we're off targets uh, globally, um, but we are making uh, advances. Uh, what about for the pregnant women? I showed you these uh, green bars previously that were up to 82%. Here are the number of children that are perinatally infected, if you will, uh, coming down. Their targets should be down here uh, for 2025. Um, and we need to get more pregnant women screened and onto therapy. And if they're going to breastfeed, to continue that therapy. But the good news in the lining of all this is that three and a half million um, uh, infections have been averted uh, in children as a result of PMTCT uh, regimen. So if we didn't do what uh, that previous graphic had shown you, uh, the epidemic be looking like this, uh, but it, it really is the green line that's been coming down. So. Good news, um, but a ways to go. I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Kay Grabowski uh, here at Hopkins and also the whole Rakai team that works with her. Um, they uh, did an observational study just looking at uh, before combined HIV prevention uh, 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 scale up. Uh, and shown in the blue is the incidence, the prevalence is in the brownish line. And you can see as they scale up both circumcision, uh, which is in the blue, uh, and uh, antiretroviral therapy in the somewhat purple uh, uh, graphic uh, going up over the years, you can see HIV incidence reduced by 42%. These interventions really work. And I updated it a little bit from Larry Chang sharing these graphics with us. Uh, that data was up to 2016. You can see it has continued to decline the incidence uh, in HIV in both women and in men, although it's leveling off in the men, showing men are in fact harder to reach uh, in this uh, effort. Uh, Larry Chang of our division has really done some phenomenal studies with Joseph Kagai and the other Rakai um, team, uh, looking at the scale up of antiretroviral drugs, viral suppression, uh, and uh, male circumcision in the highest incident population within Uganda. These are the fishing communities. And here is their incidence, a ra annual rate of 4%. Uh, and you can see it declined in both women and men uh, over his uh, four-year period of scale-up uh, during this. And that has to continue, continued to decline as well. So now back to the global uh, scenario. And uh, shaded in here are different regions of the world as defined by WHO. Uh, and I'm just going to we're gonna go through some graphics pretty quickly here because of time, but I want you to see that HIV new infections have not done much in terms of declines in the United States. I'll show you those. Um, a little bit better in Canada and Western Europe. Uh, Latin America, it's actually gone up. South, uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, they've gone down dramatically. Uh, the Middle East and North Africa, it's increased. Eastern Europe, Russia, Ukraine, and so forth, increased 33%, and a decline in Asia. So I'm going to show you these graphics very rapidly. Uh, it's just to give you a sense of what's going on regionally. Here is Sub-Saharan Africa, 57% decline in a new HIV infection since 2010, and a 58% decline in AIDS-related deaths. That's PEPFAR at work, in all honesty. Here's Asia and the Pacific, a uh, 14% decline, but it's leveling off. Um, and uh, therapy has decreased mortality phenomenally. This is probably the saddest area, this in the Middle East, as I'll show you. This is Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Um, since 2010, an increase of nearly 
50% new infections, 46% in AIDS-related deaths. Here's the Middle East and North Africa. Again, there's a war going on. Uh, um, so uh, that's going to be interrupting uh, all of this as well. Uh, sadly, Latin America, I don't know what's going on there. They look like the United States a bit. I thought they were doing better, but it doesn't look like it when you look at these graphics in terms of new infections increasing by 8%, although AIDS-related mortality going down still. The Caribbean, uh, AIDS mortality has gone down, but again, number of new infections leveling off. Uh, and I should have mentioned all of these, the y-axis changes as the number of people living with HIV changes uh, in different regions of the world. Here's Europe and North America. I actually do not include the US in here and I'll show you why I'm gonna give you the US data uh, coming up. But you can see um, it is declining just not as rapidly as we would like. So what's the US look like? 1.2 million people living with HIV, still 13% unaware. Um, a large number of people have died over the uh, 40 years. Um, and I'm gonna give you some of the numbers of people being newly diagnosed, but in our epidemic, nearly 70% still is among gay and bisexual men. Here is our graphics, and, and I actually, this, the, the graphic I pulled for, uh, uh, from the national strategy, which stopped actually here, showing it was starting to go down, and they did in an extension out to 3,000 by 2030. These are the actual numbers, which they don't show you, uh, but uh, they're on the CDC website. In 2020, there were 30,000 new cases, so there was a decline, but in 2021, it actually rose to 36,000. Blame COVID if you want, but I think it's more than just COVID, uh, and we'll have to wait and see. Again, we sort of went over these numbers. Most of the new cases are among men who have sex with men. How, how are we doing in viral suppression? It's hard to get national data on viral suppression. CDC needs to do a better job on that. The only last graphic they have, this is from like three years ago, we're at 59%. These are our partner countries uh, in, in terms of high income country, high income. Um, and you can see they're all doing much better than us. I, I recently looked up Australia. This has to be updated. They're at 88% now. But we do have some, uh, again, silver lining in that shadow, and that's Ryan White. Uh, and again, this is a couple years old, um, but nevertheless shows good viral suppression. And we're using very hard numbers, less than 50 uh, viral suppression uh, compared to the national average. Now to wrap this up, I'm gonna talk about the prevention continuum since uh, all of you know the positive one. And for the first two decades, all we did was structural interventions and behavioral interventions. But in the last two decades, we've expanded that. The treatment is prevention, circumcision in heterosexuals, uh, PrEP, uh, and combining these. Vaccines and cure remain the elusive uh, um, hits that we're just not there on. The best prevention for HIV negative people in a high risk situation uh, would be uh, PrEP, uh, one pill once a day, 99% effective if you adhere to it. But it's not being taken up uh, in our country very well um, or internationally. The target for 2022 was to have 3 million people on uh, therapy on PrEP, and uh, they believe about 1.3 million uh, scripts were uh, fulfilled. Uh, so we have a ways to go in the U.S., a lot of discrepancies. It's the white uh, uh, population that uh, at high risk that do take PrEP, whereas the higher risk African-American population 
uh, is not accessing PrEP at the rate that it should. All of this requires funding, and uh, we're in a worrisome time. For 2025, we need $29 billion. Where are we in 2022? We're at 20. So that gap, a treatment gap or prevention gap, is still about $9 million. How are you doing in Ryan White? I showed this to Jeannie last night. Uh, Ryan White current funding is up around $2.5 billion. That sounds great compared to what it was. But if you adjust for inflation and looking at spending ability, you're really still stuck in year 2000 in terms of um, the available funds and what they buy in, in today's money. So the ultimate goal uh, in the U.S. is pre-exposure, prophylaxis, plus treatment as prevention, uh, and to reduce the number of new infections by 90%. How are we doing? HIV incidence is unchanged. Current federal and state laws create significant structural barriers. We have a patchwork of insurance coverage, insufficient numbers and distribution of expert medical providers. We still have a problem with stigma. And you have to think about what could we do different to achieve the goals that our national strategy uh, lays out for us. Well, we need products that work in terms of prevention. We need high effectiveness of oral prep. We need to get prep out. Communication is key. We need to get people retested and tested on a regular basis and moved into whether they're positive or negative. Um, now, uh, as I close out the talk, I wanted to throw in, well, you know, COVID did come along and it did interrupt a lot of these programs. Uh, it is somewhat subsided in terms of fatalities, but I wanted to just expose these two graphics, uh, each flag is a death from COVID in the United States, as well as the AIDS quilt representing the fatalities of AIDS. And you can see we were devastated by both of these uh, pandemics. But within a year or two, we had vaccines for COVID, we have therapy for COVID, we have testing for COVID, everyone goes gets tested if they get the sniffles. That's not happening for AIDS, and we need to do a better job on all of those elements. So here's PEPFAR's goals. Um, 2024, we got to aim for that 95-95. All countries need to exceed that by next year uh, if we're going to eliminate this disease. So this is their mantra, sustain and accelerate the process. It is the most successful uh, program uh, in health uh, today. This is my last graphic. Thanks for everyone listening. I know you got to get back to clinic, but my vision as I started thinking about this is we need to continue to improve the safety and potency of antiretroviral therapy for treatment and viral suppression. Uh, less than 50. Uh, U equals U. Expand safe injecting, uh, injection practices globally, voluntary male circumcision in Africa needs to be expanded. Implement a range of effective, safe, approachable combination prevention strategies. Expand PrEP. Build a safe and durable HIV vaccine. The goal is greater than 60% efficacy. Uh, I know folks on uh, online are working on the cure um, for HIV. There's a lot of momentum here, uh, and uh, we have high hopes we might get to a cure before we get to a vaccine. And with these tools implemented at scale, we can then durably reduce HIV incidence domestically and globally. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I apologize for taking us to the end of the hour, but... Um, you know, I'm available if people have questions or uh, want to uh, discuss uh, in more detail. Thanks, everyone. Well, Tom, that was amazing. And uh, 
even though we all have other things to do, almost everyone is still here because it's just, you provide such a, a depth and a breadth of knowledge about this and, and really like these very exciting problems that we can still work on. And also, you know, we've done some really amazing things. We, not including me so much, but along the way, a lot of yeah. amazing things have happened. So it's a very optimistic um, view. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you everyone for being here this afternoon and uh, have a great weekend. Thanks, Eileen.